Nehemiah, the sixth chapter. We, we're winding down our series. I got one more off of Nehemiah. Uh, and that's uh, Nehemiah, the sixth chapter. And uh, we're going to start uh, first through the ninth verse, and then I'm going to do f 15 and then 16, and then we're going to get into the word. Can we stand for the reading of the God's word? The book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. It says, when word came to Sambalat and to Bayam and Gisham, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. Though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sambalat Gisham sent this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Yeah. Then the fifth time, Sam Ballard sent his aide to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Gisham says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us converse together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You are making it out of your own head. They are all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and we will not be completed. It will not be completed. But I pray, Lord have mercy. Let me tell somebody, but I pray. But I pray. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Yes, now, I want you to go down to verse 15. So the wall was completed in the, 20th, tw in, in the 25th of Eula in, the 50, in 52 days. In 52 days, when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. My Lord, have mercy. What a word. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. I looked out and saw Pastor Daryl Sims. Pastor Sims, stand up for one minute. They can see you. Pastor Sims, good to see you. He's open for our men and everything. He's now in Washington, D.C. Glad that you are in our midst. Amen. I want to preach from our series on rebuilding walls, rebuilding people. The, the, the sermon is entitled, Finish It. Come on. Two words. Tell your neighbor, finish it. Finish it. Finish it. Now, here's the thing, beloved. We have been, over these last few weeks, we have talked about Nehemiah, and we have talked about how Nehemiah did something about the situation. The people in the communities were falling apart around him, but Nehemiah didn't just stand around and watch this negative things happen. He did something about it. What I want you to know, many of us have good intentions, but we don't necessarily have God intentions. Many of us will stand around and complain, but do nothing about the situation. Many of us, we can see what needs to be done, but many of us will not step up and accept our assignments. But what I love about Nehemiah is that he did something about the destruction of Jerusalem. He did something about the city's broken walls. He did something about broken people. Instead of talking about the conditions of Jerusalem, he and the people decided to put their love into action and they did something about it. 
I shared with you over these last few weeks that Nehemiah is a powerful example of how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things for him. Then we talked about how to handle our haters, yes. How to handle the critics, uh, the people, the peanut gallery that constantly uh, says negative things about us. And, and what I've learned from Nehemiah, if there's one thing that I've learned, is that accepting God's assignment, is that doing something about broken walls and doing something about broken people and broken communities can be risky business. In other words, doing God's work can be extremely difficult and sometimes even dangerous. In fact, if you do not believe me, I told you to go with me on the journey of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I know when you look at the book of Nehemiah and you look at the work of Nehemiah, I know that it doesn't seem logical that doing God's work, that doing something so positive, I know it seems unbelievable to many of us that Nehemiah could leave a good government job and with all of its perks and all of its power and all of its prestige and all of its privilege, how he can give up all of that to go back to his country and help rebuild the wall and rebuild community and rebuild the people's faith. I know that it's hard to believe that doing something so noble and so righteous could be considered as risky business. But I'm here to submit to you today, beloved, that it was risky business then, and it's risky business now, and I'm here to tell you it will always be risky business. And any time you do something positive for God, you're going to find yourself with a bunch of critics and a bunch of haters all around you. I ain't going to get no help in here today. Ah, but as I read Nehemiah, I found in Nehemiah something to give us strength for our struggle, power for our pain, and victory over our enemies. Nehemiah gives powerful insight on how to build in the presence of difficult and sometimes impossible conditions. As I shared with you over these last few weeks, Nehemiah has been building this wall. And now as we read in the text, he has finally finished it. But not only did he finish it, but he finished it in 52 days. Tell your neighbor 52 days. He finished it. So, so I want to talk about the whole aspect of finishing this wall. So my thing, my question is, what do you think is easier, beloved? Is it easier to start a job or is easier to finish a job? What's easier, starting a project or finishing a project? Although there are challenges to getting started, I would submit to you today that the greater challenge is actually following through. Yeah. Uh, the greatest challenge is actually making sure that the job actually gets done, that the project is actually completed. That's the hard job. Oh, I know, beloved, it's one thing to start school. It's one thing to go back to school, but it's another thing to finish school. Oh, I ain't gonna get no help with you. It's one thing for you to start a project around your house. It's one thing, yeah, we'll start a project and everything is unfinished. The kitchen half finished. Oh, Lord, I ain't gonna get no help in here. You ain't gonna get no help in here. You you trying to convince everybody that half the wall was supposed to be that color and all that kind of stuff. You lying through your teeth. You, we trying to understand why is it when we turn on the lights, the toaster come on. We can't understand that. You started cleaning out the garage and all of a sudden you didn't finish. Start cleaning out the basement. You went to that junk room that you keep all that junk in there and you swear up and down you're going to get in there and one day and every time you pass it, you never get to it. And when you start on it, you start on it and get halfway through and never finish because it's one thing to start something, but it's another thing to finish. How many times have we started something and did not finish? How many times have many of us started diets? Every single week, we started a diet. 
and we never stick to it. You even started a diet today. You said, after I leave here, I'm going to the Cheesecake Factory. I'm going to get my red velvet cheesecake. I'm getting my Linda Fudge cake, and I'm going to eat it today, and I'm going to have my meal, and I'm going to my house, and I'm clearing out all that stuff in there, and I'm locking it up, and I'm hiding the key, and all that, and because I'm going to stick to my diet. And you start out, and you say, I'm going to be good, and Monday morning, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m., and I'm going to the gym as soon as it opens I'm going to get my body together and everything as soon as 5 a.m. hits you hit the snooze and say I'm going to go at 5 30 and then you say you know what I'm going to go this afternoon as soon as I get off from work I'm going to go because here's the thing we never stick to it did you know that 90% of if all the New Year's resolutions that we have, we never follow through with it? Some of us have a whole list of New Year's resolutions, and then all of a sudden, January the 5th, they all gone. You don't even know where the resolution is. Because here's the thing. It's easy to start something, but it's also hard to finish. Because quitting is one of the easiest things there is to do. When we face a challenge that appears insurmountable, we would sooner give up than to try to do something else. Rather than pushing through the pain of the challenge, many of us would rather give up. In fact, many of us, we know people in our lives who, who do nothing but quit. We know people who are serial quitters. <laughs> They're serial quitters. You, you don't believe anything they say because you know they're never going to follow that. I'm going to die tomorrow. You go, yeah, right. It's not going to work. I'm going to stop shopping. I promise you I am. I done cut up all my credit cards. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Because they're serial quitters, and they quit everything, but then you know what? They don't ever follow through. In fact, when I was in Africa, uh, I, I noticed that even when I, was, when I was there, that people were building in Ghana and in Cameroon. They would build a house, and they would get started with all the brick and all that. They would get started, and the house would be half finished. And that's because many of the places in Africa, you can't go to the bank and get financing for it. And so they, they build it as they go with the resources that they have. And so people would build their homes with whatever money they had. And when they ran out of money, the building just sat there. And, and the people either moved on or someone else might have come along and purchased it. But many times the building just sat there until they received or found more money. And I'm sitting there and you're sitting there saying, well, what does that have to do with me, Pastor? Well, I'm wondering if many of us are not like the building projects I saw in Cameroon and the building projects I saw in Ghana. Many of us, we start off with a bang. And, we, we, you know, we, we're building our spiritual life. We go to Sunday school and Bible study. We, we're in Sunday school every Sunday. We're in Bible study in small groups. We read our Bible. We are so saved and so sanctified and so filled with the precious Holy Ghost of God. And then we run out of spiritual food. We complain that being saved is too hard. We complain that it, this isn't what I thought. I, I thought I was going to be on easy street as soon as I got with Jesus. It's too hard. And then our building spiritually is half completed. And we sit there and we walk around with our half completed faith, our half completed walk with God, our half completed relationship with God, all because we ran out of spiritual gas. But the question is, what is it that's standing in the way of us finishing our faith? What is it standing in the way of us following through on our walk with Christ? What is it that's standing in the way of us worshiping, growing, and serving of God? Because here's the thing. It's always easier to start something than it is to finish. But here's the thing. I want you to know why this is so important, beloved. Because the system is actually set up because it assumes that we're going to quit. The system is set up for us not to finish. And you say, what are you talking about? The system is set up that way. Look at our school system, beloved. It, 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 the schools in our community, they seem to be set up to ensure that many of our children just drop out, fall out, or be run out. 
It's there. You see it over and over again. They are tested on this and tested on that. So many tests that the teachers can't even teach because they're preparing for the next test that they're having. Even in our colleges, our colleges are set up for quitters. Yes, it is. It, it, because they've set up for quitters because they have all of these standards, all of these requirements, all of this kinds of financing, all of it ensuring for us to drop out. They sneak you in that first semester, and then all of a sudden, you can't afford the next semester or the next semester. I ain't going to get no help up in here. They bailed out all kind of banks, and yet they don't bail you out. You know, they, they can't seem to find the owner of the crack house on your block, but they can certainly find you when they need that student loan paid. <laughs> <laughs> they can certainly find you. All of a sudden, they just pop up somewhere. You can't get the name or the person that did something to you on the block, but they can certainly find you when they need that student loan pay. But here's a person who has mastered. I want you to know there, there, there's an organization that has mastered, a company that has actually mastered quitting. They've mastered it. And you know what that organization is? It's the health club. It's the fitness center. They've mastered it. Because they count on people signing up for the gym membership and they're counting on you to quit. And because they need you to quit because there's not enough bikes and there's not enough treadmills for everybody. So they're counting on it. They're saying we got a thousand people uh, that's a part of this gym and we hope only 50 show up. Because they've mastered quitting. You laughing about that, but that's the truth. That's the truth. Many of us got memberships that they taking off, they debit card, and you still trying to figure out, what is that on my, my, my bank account? You know, what is that? What, what's this $29.95? You calling your bank saying, why I get this $29.95? What's this on my thing? Oh, that's uh, LA Fitness. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Have mercy. I thought I took that off. Because they what? They mastered quitting. Southwest Airlines, they don't even assign you a seat. And you know why they don't sign you a seat? Because they want to guarantee the fact that you're not going to show up. They want to make sure, they, they almost, they're almost counting on the fact that you're going to miss your connection because then they can sell another seat. Oh, I ain't going to get no help in here. Because here's the thing, because they're anticipating us not finishing. There's always something or always someone or some distraction or some obstacle. There's always some problem that prevents many of us from finishing. When we look at what it takes to finish versus where we are and what we have, many of us will turn around and say, I give up, I simply give up, forget about it, I can't finish because it's just too hard. Because I want you to understand that it's easier to get started than it is to finish the job. But I want you to understand that this feeling is not something new to us. The Bible is filled with people who wanted to quit. It's filled with people who said, I don't think I can finish this. There are many in the Bible who were in the midst of some impossible situation, some difficult situation, some unbelievable situations, ah, and they wanted to quit, but somehow they did not quit. In fact, they embodied the words of the great uh, uh, coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the 60s, Vince Lombardi, who said, quitters never win and winners never quit. So they embodied that in the word. No one embodies this more than the person in our text this morning than Nehemiah. Nehemiah was called by God to do what seemed almost impossible, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which had been laid in ruins for 100 years. We have learned how Nehemiah was given favor with the king, how he prayed and waited for the right timing, and how God gave him success in organizing the people for the work. We also have spent time talking about all the haters and ridicule, people who ridiculed him and, and, and even made the people get tired and weary and afraid. But through it all, Nehemiah reminded the people to keep their focus on God. And we see as we wind to the end of this particular passage, we see how Nehemiah continues to wade through the obstacles. 
his enemies and wade through the enemies, uh, uh, the obstacles that the enemies try to throw in his pathway. We see how he managed to do what seemed for many of us so difficult, how he happened to finish the job and do it in 52 days. I find it amazing that he's able to do this. And I say to myself, why is it so hard when you're doing something for God? Why is it so hard? Why, why does it be to do something positive for your life? Why is it so hard going through treatment? Why is it so hard go, fi, trying to finish school? Why is it so hard to do that? How do we hold on just a little while longer? And the question becomes, how did Nehemiah do it? How did he stay focused? How did he finish well? And how do we finish well? In fact, uh, God is calling for us to finish what he, we've started. Because I want you to know, when I was working on my doctorate, and, and uh, Reverend Crawford can attest to this, my professor told me that the hardest part will be your last year. He said you'll be tired and worn out and worn down. But he told me you better stay focused. Because if you don't stay focused, you will wander in the street and get hit by distraction. So you have to stay focused. You must stay focused to finish your thesis. Don't get so tired and so get so tired but that you don't stay focused. And he said, don't get so excited about graduation that you don't finish the requirements. He told me, make sure that you sweat the small stuff. Yes. I know there are books that tell you don't sweat the small stuff and all that, but you better sweat the small stuff. Because if you want to graduate, you better sweat the small stuff. Many of us know that the hardest part, the women in here know the hardest part of pregnancy is the last month, the last push. Many people who have been through treatment know that the last week is the hardest one. The hardest part of parenting is the teenage years when these jokers are supposed to be getting out your house. And the reason that, you, that they're hard years is because they know everything. Oh, my God. They know everything. 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 Uh, all they know, they know everything, but they don't have no money. But they know everything. They don't know how to get money, though, but they know everything. And sometimes they know everything that it'll make you dust off your cussing outfit. Yes, it will. It'll frustrate you to death dealing with them because it's the hardest part of that. In fact, I used to tell you all the time when my grandmother said when they're young, you will tell them about Jesus. And when they get older, you will tell Jesus about them. Oh, somebody know what I'm talking about. Somebody know what I'm talking about. When they're young, you tell them all about Jesus. And when they get older, you on your knees telling Jesus all about them. Because it's hard. Because this is when the enemy comes in to distract us the most. This is when we're about to lose it because we're not where we used to be and we're not where we want to be fully. We're in the place that I often call the meantime, the in-between time. Have you ever been in between jobs and in between situations, in between relationships? Because the in between is where you want, it, 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 it's in between where you want to be and where you are, and you'd rather be anywhere but there. Let me say that one more time. Let me say that one more time. I'm, I'm preaching up in here. You all, you, you all, you, you, you all asleep on this, baby. Because the in between time, the in, in the meantime, is in between where you want to be and where you are, and you'd rather be anywhere but there because it's the in the meantime. And I tell you over and over again, the meantime can be a mean time. It can be difficult. It can be the time where you're about to give up. It's a be the, it's a time you want to cash in everything. Because, see, you have to fight to finish. You have to fight to stay focused. Oh, Lord, here are some things that Nehemiah did, and, and I want us to pay attention to this because here's the thing that he did. As the wall was near completion, the enemies of Nehemiah realized that the frontal attacks did not work. The Bible says that the work was near completion, and there was no breaches in the wall. And if there are no breaches in the wall for the enemy to sneak in, pay attention, 
for the enemy to sneak in, where does the enemy, where does the enemy go? How does he get in? If the army is, 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 is powerful enough, how does he get in? Because he, he, the, the city is fortified at that point. But if the army is not powerful enough to overcome your defenses, Satan cannot enter. Because the presence of the Lord is in your life. How does he come in? How, how is it possible for him to come in if you are fortified, if your walls are strong and there are no breaches? Here's the thing. Then how is it possible for him to come in? The answer is simple. Since he cannot come in, he will try to get you to come out. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he will. If Sambalat couldn't get him to come, couldn't get in because the wall was strong, he tried to lure Nehemiah out. And if Sambalat could lure Nehemiah from behind his secure walls and set up a meeting, then the battle could still be won and the rebuilding of the city would cease. But I want you to know, watch what Nehemiah does because it's important if you're trying to finish. Here's the thing that you got to know this, beloved, is don't get involved in negotiations with the enemy. Oh, yes, but that's verses 1 through 4. One of the devil's greatest strategies to hinder us from serving God is negotiations. He will negotiate with you, beloved. The Bible says he negotiated with Eve, and you probably read other stories about people who made a deal with the devil. And here's the thing. Whenever you make a deal and negotiate with him, you usually end up with the short end of the stick. Oh, look at, look at the Bible. I, I'm in the Word. In the Word. In Genesis, the third chapter, the first verse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Eve, in other words, let's get together and think about this logically. Let's negotiate. Let's talk it out. And E, do you really think God is looking out for your best interest? Oh, no, 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 beloved. By the time the devil had finished negotiating with Adam and Eve, they had lost everything. In fact, they had lost everything and was kicked out of the garden because they were negotiating with the enemy. Don't negotiate with the enemy. Have a no negotiation clause, clause in your contract. With, But watch this. This chapter, Nehemiah is a man who is dedicated to serving the Lord. But the devil sends someone, his, one of his servants, to try to bring Nehemiah to the negotiation table. Sambalat, Tobiah, and Gisham were all enemies of Israel. They were bent on finding a way that they could hinder the work of God. But here they invited Nehemiah to sit down and talk to him, and they wanted him to come to a small town called Ono. Now anytime anybody bring you to a place called Ono, you better say, oh no. That's right. That's right. When they take you to a place and say, meet me at oh no, you say, oh no, 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 no. Can't go there. Oh no, 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 no. No, no, no. It's going to be happening in oh no. You say, oh no, no, no. Oh no. Because here's the thing. Check out this. The enemy of Nehemiah tried to negotiate using false friendship. Their plan was not to congratulate him on his hard work. Their plan was not to offer assistance to the building project. Their ultimate goal was to bring harm to him. But look at the place that they lured him to expose the motives behind their plan. They wanted to lure him to a place called Ono. So I looked up what the Hebrew word actually Ono meant. The Ono was a Benjamin, Benjamite town about 70 miles, seven miles east of Joppa. The name Ono in Hebrew means grief. So in other words, what they did was they used false friendship 
in order to lead Nehemiah to a place of grief. I'm helping somebody in here. See, you got to be careful for people who are followed. People who say they're your friends because friends bring the best out of you. False friends bring the worst out of you. Oh, their goal is never to bring harmony to you, never to bring peace to you. Their only job of false friends is to bring you to a place of grief and destruction. Four times they asked for a meeting and four times Nehemiah replied the same way. I'm too busy to come and deal with this peanut gallery. I'm too busy to deal with the bozo canal. I'm too busy to deal with that because I've got important things to do. And here's the thing. The devil loves to call you up and spend time talking to you. See, see if he can keep you on the line, he can eventually negotiate with you. If he can keep you on the line, he can plant seeds of doubt and discouragement. The, what, you know the devil is like a diabolical telemarketer. Oh, Lord. The longer the, the diabolical telemarketer keep you on the line, the better chance they get to sell you something. So he can get you to hinder your faith in, in serving God. He can get you to stop your, all of this stuff. He can get you to, 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 to get in the way and discourage you and walk, have you walk away from your finished product. You all almost there, but you'll walk away because you on the line with a diabolical telemarketer named Satan. But here's the strategy that you need to use, is give him a busy signal every time. Don't answer when he calls. Make it plain. Don't answer when he calls. See, it's not him calling that's the problem, it's when you answer. Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, oh, somebody, let, let, let me make it plain for somebody in here. It's not the late night text or the call late night that's the issue. It's when you start answering it. That's where the problem comes in because you know there's nothing on the streets after one o'clock but dogs and troublemakers and don't look like you got a tail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you out there doing something. Oh, yeah. You ain't, there ain't no prayer meetings at one o'clock in the morning. So don't tell me you're going over there to lay hands. Yeah, you laying hands all right. Oh, yes, you are. You laying hands. That's right. You doing, you in places you ain't supposed to be. You better say, oh, no, I can't go. Oh, no, I'm not going to respond. Because the problem is, is when we answer. It's not the alcohol that's the problem. The problem is, is you don't know how to stop. You think every day is a holiday. You think every day is Christmas. You think every day is New Year's Eve. You don't know how to stop. You think every day is a celebration. Oh, it's a celebration. Oh, you woke up this morning. I think I'll drink a little bit. Oh, I, I made it home. Well, oh, I think I'll you, you, Every day is a celebration. You say it's in the Bible. I don't understand it. The people drink in the Bible. Yeah, but they didn't have cognac and they didn't have, oh Lord, they didn't have vodka and all that. No people drank some straight wine that was part Probably deluded. You drinking some hard stuff, baby, and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I know what I'm saying. So the alcohol is not the problem. Is you can't stop. See, the the mall is not the problem. The mall ain't the problem. You sitting there cursing them all in the name of Jesus. I curse you, Chicago Ridge. In the name of Jesus, I curse you, Woodfield. Oh, the water tower is the devil and all that. You putting X marks on Nordstrom's rack and all that. And TJ Maxx in the name of Jesus and all that kind of. That's not the problem. The problem is, is you don't know how to say no. You don't know how to go past there and not buy something. You don't know how to do that. You cannot do that. For some reason, you don't know. You're not capable of walking past there. It, it, it's crazy for us to do that. It's crazy to, for you to go into a place like that. So the best strategy is to stay away. Don't go. Don't shop. Don't go. Because here's the thing. You can never allow hungry hounds to guard the meat house. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can't have hungry hounds guarding the meat house because guess what? They'll negotiate every time. See, and I always tell you, don't go out when you're weak because when you get strong, you'll wonder what you've done. <laughs> you'll wonder what you've done. you say, oh my God, I was with that. Yes. That's because you was weak. You was desperate at that time. We were all trying to tell you. We were shocked when we saw you out with them. We said, whoa, is it that bad that they got to go out with that? Whoa, Lord have mercy. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
God, look at them. They look like seven miles of bad road with no turns. Oh, my God. How do I say this? Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness gracious alive. That's because you went out when they were weak. And now that you're back strong, you're wondering what you've done. You trying to dodge them and everything. Now you don't want them to, you don't want to return their call and everything. When you was weak, you was calling them. Oh, I ain't gonna get no help in here today. Don't allow yourself to begin negotiation, nego negotiating the right and the wrongs with the devil because you'll lose every time. But here's the thing, is, is don't give in to intimidation because when he can't pull you out, he'll start intimidating you. That's what verse 5 and 7, 5 through 9 says. The devil can't talk you into not serving God, but he can try to scare you out of serving God. When Sam Ballad and the Bozo company did, they, they came to see Nehemiah, and he wouldn't negotiate with them. They went to plan B, which is intimidation. They will intimidate you. And you know what the enemy will use to intimidate you sometimes? He will use gossip to do that. Did you know that gossip spreads faster than any disease? Somebody sent me an email not long ago. It's entitled Gossip. It says, hello, my name is Gossip. I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts. I ruin lives. I'm cunning. I'm malicious. I gather strength with age. The more I'm quoted, the more I'm believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect, protect themselves against me because I have no name. I have no face. I have no way of you tracking me down. Tracking me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I'm nobody's friend, and once I tarnish reputation, it is never the same. I have toppled governments, I have ruined marriages, I have destroyed careers, I've made innocent people cry in their pillow. All I need you to do is get me started. Thank you for listening. My name is Gossip. Oh, my goodness gracious. So we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated because these guys sent a letter to Nehemiah accusing him and the workers of rebelling against the king. Beloved, go be beloved gossip, uh, 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 they used gossip to try to intimidate him. But here's the thing, if, 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 if Nehemiah didn't meet with them, they were going to report to, ne report to the king that Nehemiah was actually trying to form a coup against the king. Now, why do you say this is a real issue? This was a threat because a few years earlier, if you read in the text, the Persian king had stopped reconstruction on the walls of Jerusalem for this very same reason. So Sambalat's letter to Nehemiah could not only hinder the work of God, but it could stop it completely. Do you know how many people are mad at you because of gossip? Are you aware of that? They don't even know the facts about you. They don't even know the facts about your life. They don't even know. They, do you know there are people who would rather believe a lie than to believe the truth about you? Do you know how many people believe lies about you and all of a sudden they thought you were stuck up, they thought you were mean, they thought you were difficult, they thought you were arrogant, they thought you were lazy, but then after meeting you, they say, I can't believe that I allowed other people to define me find you, define you. I allowed gossip to dictate my relationship with you. Here's the thing. Don't you dare respond to gossip. In fact, Nehemiah was delivered from other people's opinions. There are people who, who, who have met you and connected with you, and you are nothing like other people have said to them about you. And so as a result of it, beloved, you got to know, don't allow gossip, and don't allow gossip to define relationships with other people. Finally, beloved, is don't fall prey to spiritual attacks, which is verse 10 through 15. Now pay attention to this, beloved, because this is a hard one to spot. Nehemiah's enemies went to false prophecy, to a false prophet named Shemaiah, and they paid him to deliver a false prophecy to Nehemiah. In the verse, the prophet told that he was marked for assassination. Nehemiah, you're going to be killed. 
He pretended to be on Nehemiah's side, and he suggested that Nehemiah would hide in the temple to escape this plot. Here's the problem with the plan. By God's law, only the priests were allowed in the temple. And so Nehemiah wasn't a priest. So Nehemiah would lose credibility among the people if he went there. And so as a result, they were trying to lure him with false prophecy to a place where he was not supposed to be. But here's the thing. So, I, so, so you, you, you're saying, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I want you to know, here's the point. Beware of people who come to you all spiritual. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You got to be aware of the super, 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 super saints. You know, who come, oh, in the name of Jesus. Oh, the Lord got a word for me. The Lord got a word. He got a word for you. You be careful for all those people. You got to be careful for them because some people are false prophets. You running in this line and running in that line and all that kind of stuff. You got all kind of folk laying hands on you. You need to stop all of that. You got all these people, all these spirits all over your house. And because you got all these people supposed to be this man of God and this woman of God, you don't know what these people are. You don't know anything about these people. And you need to check the spirit by the spirit. In other words, you got to be careful because people will tell you all kind of lies. Oh, the Lord, uh, the Lord told me that if you went to the riverboat today, you're going to win. <laughs> Oh, the Lord told me to tell you your number getting ready to fall. Oh, play the lottery tomorrow. The number going to fall. You know that. The people tell you, oh, it's entertainment. It's entertainment. It's entertainment. That's all. I don't understand why I can't go to the river. It's entertainment. What kind of sense is that for you to take your hard-earned money and put it into a machine? You put it in a machine, and the machine is rigged, and you know it's rigged, and you know it's rigged, and you know it's rigged. They put it, it's rigged. You know these people got a bigger house than you have, so you know your house is not going to win, right? So the house is always going to win because they got a bigger house than you got. You know, they got more resources. So why are you putting money there? It doesn't make sense. It's entertainment. Oh, I, I just get, I, I, I get high just a little bit. I drink a little bit. But, you know, the people in the Bible, they drank. In other words, don't allow false prophets to tell you these things. You give, uh, 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 you know, this your year to get married. This your year to get a man. This your year to come out of it. Really? Really? You don't even like people, so how is it going to be your year to get in a relationship? <laughs> so you already know that's a false prophet right there. But here's the thing, Nehemiah learned to stick with it. And I'm gonna close with this. So he finishes everything. He finishes everything. So what I was stuck at is the fact that his enemies are coming at him and yet he's able to maintain it. So I'm, so I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching the Learning Channel and the Discovery Channel and, I, and, 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 and I'm watching a documentary on codfish. It's blessing my spirit. <laughs> but here's the thing about the codfish that blessed my, the whole story. is You know, I went to school in, in New England, and the codfish are very popular, particularly like Cape Cod and all that, very popular codfish. Well, did you know that they were trying to ship the codfish over other places across the United States. But whenever they would ship it frozen, it would come and it would be mushy and it would lose its flavor. So they were trying to figure out which way, how they could get it to not lose its flavor. So then they decided to ship it live. And when it arrived, it still had lost its flavor. Then they turned around and they put in the, in the, in the, in the container with the, with the live fish, they happened to put a catfish in there. And the catfish would chase 
the codfish all around. And what they discovered, because the catfish was chasing the codfish all around, because... because they're, na they're, they're natural predators. What they discovered is, is that when they did that, that the codfish never lost its flavor. It kept its flavor because the enemy was always chasing it. And I sat there and I said, my God, that has shown up. I'm sitting there wondering, but because the enemy's chasing me, it makes me always stay on my toes. I'm always in mode of prayer. I'm always in a mode of fasting and prayer because I know the enemy is always on my back. Is there anybody in here who say, I know I'm flavorful because I got God, oh Lord have mercy, in my life and the enemy is always saying, oh, okay, you, 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 all, you all are not, you all are not convinced of this yet. So let me, let me give you this last one. You, you, you're not convinced of this. So, so Llewellyn and the family, they came and they stayed with me. Six people at my house, they stayed with me. So you know, when people come to your house, the only time you really get the house together. You all know what I'm talking about. All the stuff you didn't do, you say, oh my God, I can't have them people come and, and, and see this. So you get it together and you make it look like it's always been there. And you know it happened. So I get there, and the man drives up to fix the lawn. Because my lawn was kind of jacked up, so they fixed the lawn, you know. And so they drive up with this, with, with this, this smell. It's manure. And I said, goodness gracious, the smell. And he said, yes, the smell is unpleasant. But in the right place, it becomes fertilizer. One place, it's manure, and it's disease, and it can kill you. But in the right place, it becomes fertilizer. And I'm saying, if you could take some of the stuff and the crap that's going on in your life, if you can put it in the right, oh, Lord, have mercy. You put it in the right place. Because guess what? When manure becomes fertilizer, it makes stuff grow. Oh, Lord, have mercy. It makes stuff grow. And many of us are wondering all the crap that's in your life. God has sent some of that stuff to help you grow. Take some of that crap so that you might continue to grow. Is there anybody in here who say, I'm taking all this crap and I'm going to make... Oh, Lord, have mercy. God is making you grow. All right, I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. Finish it. I gotta stop. I gotta cut it right off like that. I wanna run with it. I wanna shout with it. But it's 12:20. I'm late. I'm late. So I want you to give God some praise as we open this doors of the church.